Hi, everybody. Hello. Okay, and I'm now going to mute everyone, show background noise. Please unmute yourselves to speak and so on. Okay, so we're getting pretty close, probably within the next two weeks, to finishing the first, to completing the first of the Torah portion of this third book of the Torah. And it's dealing with, as we all have seen, concepts that are really beyond our our experience. None of us have ever seen you know, uh, offerings or the, how it was done, but they were a very central part of the tabernacle, so a very central part of the, the glue between God and people um, from the time that, pretty much from the time that the Jews became Jews at Sinai um, up until the destruction of the the second temple in the first century of the common era. So it is Torah and Torah we see always as being relevant to every day, even in 2022 when we're not practicing these things because Torah be read in many different keys and at many, many different levels and at its core, it's um, it's Torah. Torah means instruction. It's an instruction manual for life, for forever, for eternity. And uh, so, it, in that sense, it's really timeless. Even if some of the function is is um, very much scripted to a certain time. Okay. So we're talking about, and the last time we, we met, and we that was two weeks ago, talking about offerings that had to do some things with the, uh, when a person had made commitments. And here, along the line, the Torah goes a little further and says that the commitments of an oath of expression. So it's the following case that are violating an oath of expression. So there, there it, it, just as, as preface, in Torah thinking, the idea that of if someone's saying something and it's not notarized, it's not witnessed, it's not, it's not, you know, it, there's nothing that we would consider today, nothing anchoring it in legal commitment. The Torah says that that's not exactly reality. It, because when we, of, of sound mind, possessing a soul, and possessing a, a tremendous gift of God's called expression, communication. So our words, when we use that communication to make a commitment to each other or, or to God, to ourselves, when, when we do that, that is binding. And what it can't always be enforced even by a Torah court of law because the Torah court of law isn't is not there when you see it when you said it often and therefore it's not it's not always something that is as good as a contract because it's not as enforceable but at minimum God knows and at minimum, therefore we are we know and God knows what our words are and it, because of that because there is this gravity to the verbal commitments we make and the natural, um, a, a, a certain natural flippancy that we could have because I didn't write it, even in ancient days, just saying it, one person or another says, I'll deny it later. Um, there's this, this um, inherent danger, spiritual danger that we face where we could using our mouths and using, um, and using our communication to bind ourselves to something which has Torah gravity like anything else in Torah and that we may see it in a much more benign way. And that's, if we see it in a benign, a benign way, in other words, and not grave 
way, not, it's not so serious, then we'll treat it not so seriously. And that what we're doing, so we, we will, could end up treating something serious in a, in a, in a, in a more, I'm looking for a good word, but a okay, more ambivalent way. For that reason, the Torah actually, it, it, um, not the Torah, but uh, the Talmud, our, our Torah greats over the millennia have um, advised, or strongly advised not to make vows or oaths because they're binding. And we may forget about them. And they can be said at a time of passion, they can say of anger or uh, of excitement. And we mean it, we may mean it when we say it, but once the, the uh, emotions die down and time goes on, we totally forget about it and then violate what we said. Like, I'm never going to go into that store again, or I'm never going to, you know, uh, to go to. Speak to that person again, or I will. I'm going to. I'm going to go there every week. There are commitments. We have to be really, really careful, and, uh, and that's why there is a, a common expression in uh, in Torah thinking society, which is in the Hebrew, "beli neder," which means without a vow. So if if someone says so so you're coming or so you're gonna you're gonna buy this or you're gonna give me this, say yes, believe that without a doubt. Yeah, it's, in other words, it is my intention, but I'm not I'm not uh, vowing it because if my intention doesn't materialize and I can explain it and you're okay with it and I'm okay with it, the fact is if I vowed it, is, is God okay with it? So for me, if I, if I said to you, you're, you're selling me your iPhone and uh, for a thousand dollars and you say, so, so I'm not selling to anyone, are you gonna buy it? I said that next week, God willing, without a vow, um, then I've made a commitment to you. It's not, but it's not a, a, a valid type of commitment. So I'm safe if things don't work out. And you, I've made it clear to you. So you know that's without a vow. So vows, even though, Vows definitely have a place in in Torah. We take them, we take them very very seriously, and uh, it, it, as many of you know, we start Yom Kippur with a the the, our, the holiest day of the year. As Yom Kippur sets in, the evening of Yom Kippur, we start with a service of Kol Nidre. Kol Nidre means all the vows. We address the vows the prior year, the coming year, because those are things that are, are sitting on us. Uh, actually, let me just shut something so there's no noise here. Um, it, those vows, it can, it can be a problem for us as we're going into, we want to go into Yom Kippur, uh, unburdened of, of issues. You know, up front and center, our rabbis put the vows because they could be kind of out of our minds because we they don't even remember you made them. So we want to be careful with those. So here, Torah goes to the idea of, here, there is the following case. I'm sorry, we're on page 25, the top of the page, and that's in the verse, chapter 5, verse 4. There is the following case, that of violating an oath of expression. What's an oath of expression? That's a, it's a, it's a, a halachic Talmudic category based on language in this verse. It says, if a person swears, pronouncing with his or her lips his intention to harm himself or to do good to either himself or others in the future. So here, um, just to, to clarify, I don't think it's very, very clear. First of all, it says it has to be pronounced with the lips. Torah-wise, if in order for something to have that binding type of commitment, it has to be expressed. So if a phase, if a person says, "I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a hundred dollars to the American Cancer Society," that's a commitment, whether the American Cancer Society says it knows about it or not. I have a commitment to God. If I thought it, there is no commitment. But if it, it, at the same time in Torah thinking, if I thought it and, and with um, you know a, a certitude that this is what I'm going to do, 
if I, if I didn't say it, I don't have a legal obligation. But if, I, if it was an internal commitment, there is something to be said in, 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 in the view of our, our halachic rates, there's something to be said for a moral obligation. And this is where the commitment was. Again, it's not uh, it's not halacha commitment, and it, I guess it could depend on de details of it. But if we have a firm internal commitment, uh, then and and uh, something that obviously God knows what we're thinking, then within ourselves we should know that we have there, there's something to be said for our obligation there. But it's not a a, a legal obligation. Once we've said it, it's a legal obligation. So it may not be legally enforceable, but it's a legal obligation. So it's pronouncing, it says clearly with, with lips. And the oaths of expression is from that word, really. It's also it's the expressing with lips. That's this idea. It is said. And the intention to harm himself. I, harm himself is, I, I don't, I, the English of that, I don't really, I, I, I would have chosen different words. It's not like a, a self-harm idea, the way it's described total-wise. So when someone says, I'm not going to eat today. That's something that which is it's it's not necessarily injurious, but not to the benefit, unless it's uh, for uh, you know uh, some kind of a, a detox or something like that. Then then it is. It means something that that is not pleasurable. They're denying themselves a pleasure. So harming is a little bit. Um, I understand why they used it because we want to go because of the second uh, phrase in the sentence. But uh, this, uh, harming oneself has, I think, different uh, connotations in in today's world. It means either I am, am going to eat or I'm not going to eat. I'm not going to sleep tonight, which is not a pleasurable thing, or I am going to sleep tonight. Those are two different types of 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 commitments of oaths. To, to Again, to, to to deny pleasure to, one, to oneself, but that Torah is giving us examples, or to do good, meaning I'm, I'm going to eat, to either himself or others in the future, because in, in, in what they're they're um, specifying here, a, a distinction they're making is a halachic distinction, that if I have committed myself to eating a chocolate cake. So I'm going to do chocolate cake today, and I, and I, 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 uh, I made a, a, a an oath, and I have an oath. I have to actually eat the chocolate cake. If I said I'm going to give the chocolate cake to my neighbor, that's an oath. I have to give the chocolate cake to my neighbor. To my neighbor. If I I said I'm not going to let myself fall asleep tonight, well, I have to not let myself fall asleep tonight. If I made an oath and I'm not going to let my neighbor fall asleep tonight, it actually doesn't apply. Anything in, um, which, which is an unpleasant, non uh, that type of idea, or even injurious, obviously, to a neighbor, a person's commitment to another, you can't say, "Well, I listen, I, 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 uh, I, I, I made an oath; I have to do it." From the language of the Torah itself, there's a distinction we can derive that it's only um, something either benign or, or positive towards a neighbor. Um, if, it, it, uh, the, I mean, oh, let's just leave it over there. Okay. Um, or if he deliberately swears falsely regarding whether any particular event in the past concerning which a man, again, this is also a woman, may make an assertion in an oath actually took place. And after swearing concerning his intention, the details of the oath escape him, and because of his memory lapse, he violates his oath. This is there are inherent in, in this uh, uh, being reflected in this verse is we forgot. Either I didn't remember I, I, I made an oath. I don't remember exactly what I swore. I didn't remember that that oaths are serious. Or when he deliberately swore falsely concerning something that occurred in the past, did not realize that doing so would obligate him to offer up this offering. And he is later informed that in the case of intention for the future, he violated the oath, or in the case of swearing falsely about a past event, that, he, that what he did obligates him to bring the sacrifice. He thereby incurs guilt in one of these ways. So the, the Torah leads us in the direction now of of what happens if 
in oaths, a person swore, made oaths, and then again, accidentally, whatever it was, they they violated it. So number one is, and, and number five, it, in verse five, it says, when someone incurs guilt in any one of these cases, he must confess the sin that he committed. So here you have the idea of, of first thing is confession. And this is a, a, a one that there's in Hebrew, the, uh, the word for confession is vidui. It's, uh, you, you may see it in, in your Yom Kippur Machser, the, the, the Alchet on this, when we, when we uh, pound our chest, that's called the Vidui. Before someone passes away, if we have a chance, there's something, uh, a confession of Vidui. And this is the word of Vidui, of confession. Now, it's interesting that in the Torah, when, when the, the word vidui is used in the Torah, in the grammar of it, almost all the times it says it, it doesn't say in the grammar of it, the person must confess. It's, it's framed in what we would call in English grammar, I believe, a reflexive verb, where the, the, the subject and the object are the same. So the Hebrew of it is not, in, in the verse is not vidu, it's vihit vada, which means that the person should be confessed. And the, so uh, commentaries point to the odd language that's being used is that the Torah is underscoring that vidu is not just a formula. Like saying, I'm, I'm sorry, it's like you tell little kids how to say, I'm sorry. The kid may, may feel sorry, not feel sorry. The, the adult is telling us to say sorry, or else it's going to go to his room, or not, not going to get ice cream, or whatever. And does he say sorry? And that is not only with little kids. It happens with adults also sometimes. You know, if, if this is the, ho the hoop we have to jump through to apologize, to be able to, to move on from something, you apologize. That's not called, uh, as we I think we can all appreciate, and certainly Torah-wise, that's not called a confession. That's it's 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 a it's a formula, but it's it's a, a shell of a formula. So when the Torah uses the term confession, it says the person has to be uh, a per a confessed person. I guess it's, a, it's, a, it's a reflexive, saying that this is someone this this how we feel, and th th this is the 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 Torah is is here giving us some insight into. The, even though we're not doing these things with offerings and maybe we're not making all oaths. But in, in Torah thinking, there's there actually the core of, of moving on from something negative, what we call teshuva or you know, just our correcting our behavior. The, the, the soul of it is recognizing the negativity and and um, Moving on from it, in other words, internally saying, recognizing, saying, I'm not going to do that anymore. Moving out of that space that allowed us or propelled us to do what we now regret. But in, in the practical um, Torah thinking, there's, there's three elements to it. And I guess we speak about this in Kippur time, um, is, but it's really for every day. Um, it's the idea of if there's a, a, a mistake, now we, we recognize it's to acknowledge it internally and have regret for the past in other words, and to try to want to, to recognize what was done. Then there is um, resolving better for the future. In other words, we're going to jettison that element of the, of the behavior, the personality. So it's two steps. One is regret for the past. Then there's a positive resolution for the future. And the third one is articulating confession. Now, if you articulate confession, that would mean that if I hurt someone personally, that means that it's it's not only saying I can't believe I did that and I and I offended her, and and resolving that I'm never going to do it again, but it's actually 
genuinely saying, I'm really sorry I did that, and I, I resolve not to do that again. That's that would be a, it with a with a, a person. And with in God, with God, we'll say it's recognizing the past, moving to the future, and and we have this in our prayers three times a day, the idea of of um, confessing to God, talking to God. And um, in the liturgy, obviously, it's not going to have your particular um, uh, focus, but you can, it, it, there's always room to be able to say that and, and talk to God and confess to God. Okay. Number six. Actually, before we go to number six, we, let's look at a closer look at the bottom of 25. This is more of a, a, a little bit of a halachic perspective. When we said to harm himself or to good, either to himself or others. Examples of this, if a person says, I will fast or I will eat, or I will feed someone, even though one is not allowed to swear that he will harm himself, such an oath is nonetheless binding. So they're, they're saying, I will fast is equating as I will harm myself. I don't think we usually speak that way, but the idea is I'm going to do something that's unpleasant to me. In contrast, an oath to cause another person harm is not binding. And now we say, and bring to God, and now in verse six, back to the verses, an animal sacrifice in acknowledgement of his guilt in order to atone for a sin that he committed. This animal being a female from a flock, either a sheep or a goat, which must then designate as a sin offering. The, the priest must then make atonement for his sin. Um, by offering of this animal in accordance with all the procedures previously detailed with regard to a sin offering offered up by an individual. In the, the verse, we say the priest must then make atonement. We know that some, something went wrong here, but the, the fact that the Torah specifies again that the atonement is for a sin, our, our, our rabbis say that the sin is not only what we just said, the sin was of, of violating the one's, one's word, one's, uh, the one's oath, which is what the, the, the topic is, but the sin here is is making an oath in the first place. Well, so again, while making commitments to the temple or to charity or whatever it is, these are considered good things. And sometimes the, 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 the Talmud also will speak about sometimes when we make an oath to ourselves, it's something that that is will, will impel, propel, and support good behavior. We have to be very careful in how in, in the use of, of oaths, and therefore, this idea of even making oaths and we definitely don't want to be uh, quick with oaths. And, and the idea of this is here; it's called a, a, a sin, in other words, a, a deficiency that someone made an oath in the, in the first place. If he cannot afford a sheep. He must bring an acknowledgement of his guilt of having for having sinned two turtle doves and two young pigeons. Of either gender and of the proper age before God, the entrance of the meeting, at the tent of meeting, one for a sin offering, one for an ascent offering. Just we'll go through the rest of, of this page and we'll come to the next page. He must bring them to the priest and must offer up first offer up the fellow that is designated a sin offering, must snip off his head by cutting through the nape of its neck, below the back of its head with his fingernail. That's sorry about that. As done with any sin, a scent offering a fowl, but in this case, we must not sever the head completely by cutting both the trachea and the esophagus, or they must cut only one or the other. Holding the fowl near the altar, must sprinkle some of the blood. Of the sin offering on the all of the altar by raising and lowering the fowl as his blood spurts onto the altar. The remainder of the blood must then be pressed out onto the base of the altar as is done with the sin offerings of fowl. The priest must nip the fowl's head off and sprinkle and press out his blood with the intention that it be considered a sin offering. He must then offer up the second fowl as an ascent offering in accordance with the ordinance ascribed for ascent offerings of fowl. Thus, the priest must make atonement for him for a sin that he had committed and will then be forgiven. In this case, atonement consists of two stages. The sin offering affects pardon, and the ascent offering is a gift to God to reinstate the forgiven sinner in his favor. Here so we have two stages of atonement. The sin offering is cleansing, unburdening ourselves of the, of the schmutz, of the negativity, 
and the ascent offering is is the coming close. It's it's like the the apology, and then you know, and then the flowers are are the the, the gift. One is is trying to dispel the distance, and then the other one is 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 symbolizing the, the forging of a new closeness. So turn to page twenty six. But if you cannot afford two turtle doves or two young pigeons, you must then bring as a uh, as offering for a sin one tenth of an apha which is either two and a half liters or 2.6 quarts of fine wheat flour for a sin offering. The same procedures followed for preparing and offering up an unbaked grain offering should be followed with this flour, except that he must not pour any oil over it, nor may he place any frankincense on it, for it is a sin offering and is not appropriate for a sin offering to be so embellished. He must then bring it to the priest, because from this point on, the sacrificial procedures are to be performed by them. The priest must bring the the grain offering to the altar. After having done this, the priest must scoop out a precise fistful as its memorial portion and burn it up on the altar upon the fires that are there on which to burn up the sacrifices offered up to God. Scooping out the memorial portion and burning it up must be performed with the intention that it be considered a sin offering. Thus, the priest will make an atonement for a sin that he committed, whether it was through violating an oath regarding testimony eating consecrated food or entering the tabernacle in a state of defilement or violating an oath of expression through any of these sacrificial rites, and he will be forgiven, provided that a sacrifice is in accordance with his means. Okay, so here, these past four verses is about the case. We said that there are offerings to be brought that um, help to, to blunt the negative effects of violating our word and then to repair the relationship with God. But those are expensive. They're animals. So it says, what about a person who, who doesn't have the means? So the Torah specifies that they can go with turtle doves. That you can't afford that. You can bring meal, flour. So there's this, I guess we would call a sliding scale according to financial means so that everybody has the ability to bring an offering and to experience this, this repair of one's relationship with God, addressing uh, activity and being able to come close to, to, to God. What's interesting um, here, the Talmud focuses on something here that there's language uh, about the, that the person will be forgiven. In other words, the penitent will be forgiven for the, this violation of their word, which is obviously that that's the point. But it doesn't say that word, that phrase, when it talks about the wealthy person's commitment and, and repair, even though obviously that's what it is. The idea is that the Torah is laying out a, a, a form of repairing a, a problem that we create by not keeping our word. So that's called forgiveness. You're part of the problem. And then now we're re the, the, the uh, relationship is reinstated. But it's not spelled out, it, you know, clearly articulated when it comes to what we read the prior page that the person will be forgiven, he or she. But it's in this one, it's saying the person will be forgiven. And there's an interesting insight that the, that the Talmud points to here, which is that. In general, you know, life is about a journey for all of us. It's a journey of our souls. And we have, um, as part of that journey, we have a lot of different challenges. And there's an obstacle course, a moral obstacle course, and twists and turns. And sometimes we make the right decisions. And inevitably, sometimes we make the wrong decisions. And often it's really between, it's, be, it's a battle that we have between what we know or what we, or we or, or choose to remember about what's right and moral and what we feel. We, the, 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 the impulses we have, the instincts we have, the desire we have for self-gratification or comfort or uh, um, avoiding something uncomfortable, whatever the case is, it's an emotional thing. 
Um, that's really the, what very much drives the bus. Um, and others, you know, they have uh, there have been generations of, of non-Jewish thinkers uh, looking at whether we're rational beings, um, emotional beings. Torah would say we're both, but Torah would say that that the what, that in our normal human persona, the emotions is what's going to be the most powerful. And um, in the, the visionary, um, godly part of ourselves, then yes, the, the rational and the, it, 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 the, the, the visionary part of ourselves is is should be the, the strongest. But in the way we function on day to day, most of us. Our emotions, um, strong emotions, usually pull us in the direction that they want to go. Yes, I, I, I once saw it uh, compared, in, not in a Jewish book, compared to uh, a, a human being riding an elephant. And if the elephant really wants to go somewhere, there's very little the human being can do. They, 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 they can be yelling and kicking and slapping, but the elephant goes where the elephant wants to go. And we're, our, our visionary self, our, our conscience is very often, you know, that, that uh, puny person that's uh, riding an elephant. And uh, if, the, if the emotions become that, that, uh, that lunging elephant. So when we go through life, there's in order, very often, in order to cleanse the the soul and the whole the idea is for us to be able to connect with god through life and when the soul leaves the body the soul goes through a a a, a process of cleansing itself from any any uh, spiritual toxins that assimilated and i think we've discussed this before it's maximum of a year but the the the, the, the soul in, in a condition of truth is able to see what how it, it, it lived its life because every time we, we do something we, we make a mark an indelible spiritual mark on our souls so we'll be able to see how many times we studied and and even if we forgot about it on the human level when, when we see our souls we'll be able to see that very clearly and those will be very bright spots and the mitzvahs we've done and the, the caring phone calls we've made and all of those and then we're also going to be able to see other things that uh, we, we kind of wish we hadn't done but we're human, and sometimes we we fall into to these traps. And I say, I say very often, it's it's really a trap of just following our, our human nature and our our self um, self gratification needs, our presumed needs. And so that for that we 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 deal with that later. What happens today? We had, we're all alive, thank God, and we we live for 120 years. Then also we, we try to revisit those and to, uh, and to say, you know, that, that was a mistake and I, I kind of wish I hadn't and to regret it like we spoke about before. And that's why we have three times a day we pray and we have that opportunity. In addition to that, the Talmud tells us that an aggravation in life is often also, it's, called, it's considered a cleansing force. That when we have aggravation, and everybody walking the planet has some aggravation, um, maybe not right now, but the, the aggravation has its way of finding us. Um, those things also cleanse the soul because they, they kind of counterbalance what we've done in pursuit of self gratification. And this, they, this aggravation helps to, to blunt it. So, and the, the Talmud talks about it, and, and in, in Yiddish expression, maybe some of you remember from a grandparent, but the Yiddish, uh, Yiddish expression, if something goes wrong, they say, oh, sorry, a kapoda. But it means that it'll be a cleansing, it'll be an atonement, even though the, what, what happened to me, uh, you know, that uh, what, what my neighbor did to me has nothing to do with uh, anything I need to cleanse, but it's it, within the human condition. It's, it's, it's something we say that it, it helps to cleanse the, the the soul and even the psychologically I think we can uh, look at you say well, when, when there's aggravation it's you know where we, we it's it often a reality check to us we're not so steeped in in in, uh, in what we can get out of the world we start thinking about uh, a little bit more 
of where we want to go and how we can uh, lead a better life. Having said all that, the Talmud says that a person who has lived in poverty has uh, is, is where which is presumed to have a certain amount of aggravation. Although you can, uh, I, I, from what I, I understand, and even from somewhat what I've experienced, you can have people who have very little in the bank, but are very content and happy. We're t- not talking about that. We're talking about people who live the, the, where the poverty weighs on them. And then, and that's many people will be like that. And the, there, there's a feeling of, I, I, I can't get what I would like out of life. A person like that, the Talmud says, has really had in many ways their hell on earth, to use a, an English expression. So the cleansing has come through their lives. So when they pass away, there isn't that much for them to cleanse because they haven't had that many opportunities for self-indulgence. And, uh, and the, the aggravation has, has cleansed them to a great extent, at least. So uh, the, uh, having said all that, where, where we're going with all of this, is the Talmud will say, when it says here in the Torah, the person will be forgiven, it came to the rich person, and the rich person, the wealthy person's ability to, to um, bring an offering to repair for violating one's word. That's it, they bring an offering, and obviously they're forgiven, but it didn't spell that out. When it comes to the poor person, it's, it spells it out because, first of all, there's the idea that even with what's considered a more meager offering, there is forgiveness. But uh, in another sense, a deeper sense of the Talmud is saying, the Talmud tells us is that that, that person is, is uh, be, just because of who they are, they are forgiven because they don't have... Um, it, it, uh, material blessings in their world. This is, um, I'm sure they have some, but the material blessings in contrast to, to people who are able to, to support themselves. So, and that's a, a fundamental part of life. So they, the Torah underscores the forgiveness for this person because they leave, lead a life of, of forgiveness because of the aggravation. In the case of a lay sinner's a grain offering, the remainder of the flour will belong to the priest, just like the remainder of the voluntary grain offering. And the priests must bake the flour in any way they please and must eat it in the tabernacle precincts. If, however, the sinner is himself a priest, then his grain offering must be burned up in its entirety, entirety just like a priest's voluntary grain offering. If, when the person sinned, he set aside money to purchase a goat, but before buying it, he became poor, he may purchase and offer up two fowls, fowl in place of the goat. If he could only afford to set aside money for two fowl, but before buying them, he became even poorer and may purchase and offer up grain in their stead. Conversely, if when he sinned, he could only afford to set aside money to purchase flour, but before buying it, he became rich enough to afford two fowl or even richer so that he could afford a goat, he should offer them up instead of the grain. If he could only offer afford to set aside money to purchase two fowl, but before buying them, he became rich enough to afford a goat, he should purchase and offer up a goat instead of the fowl. The remainder of the laws concerning sin offerings will be given later. Okay, so now we come to the next topic. And again, here is still, we don't have that much on Hasidic insights, and it'll it'll start a little, little bit later. Now we have, here we have something for misappropriation. Misappropriation, there's some in, in, in normal thing, me taking your money is misappropriating. But I, I think uh, technically, misappropriation, uh, maybe even in secular terms, but certainly in Torah terms, it means misappropriating sacred money, community money, or, or temple money, or, or not only money, uh, goods. And that has a special category in Jewish law. It's called in Hebrew. It's called meila, and that there is uh, that seen with a certain gravity. That that obviously theft is seen with tremendous gravity. Um, and here they say it's I'm not stealing from anyone. 
it's it's the community and i'm the community no that's not good it's, it's very careful with uh, with charity money um and uh, I, uh, when i when, uh, i deal with charity with communal money every day and uh, it's it's something that is is a, a responsibility i don't take it lightly but um I just to tell you, it just popped into my head, is what my father told me many years ago. Um, maybe it was when I, I first started here. I can't remember that the the, um, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe started the school, the Chabad school system. Schools there were there were there was a lot of study going on in the shtetl, but not too many organized schools. And he, he created a school. Which the school system which still exists. It's, we have, we have a, a, a yeshiva Marasan as part of the system. It's called Tomchet Mune. When he started that, it was it was a, it was an institution. It was, a, it was in Russia, and it was it was, it was a big deal. And his uh, he recruited his son, who was uh, seventeen years old, and would eventually become the next rebbe. To, to help in the school. And he was, in the beginning, he was taking care of some of the administrative things. So he, they lived in the town of Lubavitch, and, um, and the, which is near Belarus more. And um, the previous Rebbe told over that he once had to go to Moscow on business, for the, on not business, on school business, on doing things for the school. And he went, and he, when he came back, his father, the Rebbe, said, how much was the train ticket? I have to pay back. The school has to pay back. And he said, no, don't worry about it. I guess, I guess he was drawing some kind of salary, and he said, it's, a, it's my gift. And uh, the, the Rebbe at the time, Rebbe Shalom Dover, and the, said to his son, that's not good. Is that if you want it, donate it to the yeshiva, go right ahead. But what, first take it back and then give it to yeshiva. Your money and the yeshiva money are two totally separate accounts. And you can't start saying, yeah, it's okay, the yeshiva, you know, it, it, I spent it, but uh, and the yeshiva owes it to me, but don't worry about it. He says, because then you could do the reverse too. That really, I owe the yeshiva, but I, you know, but I, I paid for that. So that that's very dangerous business. You have to keep them very distinct, and you're allowed to give as much charity as you want to the yeshiva, but it, you have to do it to, in the right way. Take it if it's the yeshiva owes you something, even if it's a nickel, take it back, and then you can give donate to the yeshiva. Don't just for, forgive the debt because then you can end up forgiving debts the wrong direction. So it's a, it's a, it, this is a big deal, use of, of communal funds. So guilt offerings for misappropriation. God spoke to Moses saying, if a person commits an act of misappropriation, sinning by unintentionally making personal use of any one of the sacrificial portions that are sacred exclusively to God, meaning any part of an ascent offering other than the heart, or any part of a grain offering, peace offering, sin offering, or guilt offering that is supposed to be or has been burned up on the altar, all these being termed sacrifices of offerings of superior holiness he must bring as his guilt offering to god an unblemished ram from the flock meaning a male sheep more than 13 months but less than two years old worth at least two silver shekels of the sacred shekel meaning the shekel i designated for use in the whole purpose which is 20 gera for a guilt offering 27 in addition he must pay the monetary value of the sacred item with which he sinned by making personal use of it plus a fine of 25% of its value. That's, that's a, a standard in, in Torah thinking. There's a fine of using communal funds. We add on a 25% fine to, to pay, the, which goes to the fund, the communal fund, which now becomes one fifth of the total payment. Right? It's, it's 25%. It, says, it actually says a fifth, but let's say it was $100. It's a fifth of $100 is 20. From the way the Torah, uh, the Talmud uh, uh, teaches us that, from the way the Torah frames it, it's actually that the payment should be a fifth, which means so if I give twenty-five, then altogether I'm, I'm paying back one hundred twenty-five. Then it's a, then 
my the, the fine is ends up in the as a fifth of what was ultimately given. By give, which now becomes a fifth of the total payment by giving it to the priest. The priest must then make atonement for him through the ram of a guilt offering, and he will be forgiven. The procedures for offering up a guilt, a guilt offering will be detailed later. Now let's just, just begin this, if we can, what we're calling suspensive guilt offerings. What is a suspensive guilt offering? Number, this is 17. We will now discuss the various types of guilt offerings. When we had a sin offering, then there's something called, that's a chatos in Hebrew, and then there's something called an asham, which is a guilt offering. So they're in the same category. But what's a, what's a guilt offering? If a person realizes that he might have sinned by transgressing one of the passive commandments of God, and that's the ones we should not do, that are punishable by excision if he committed intentionally, but he does not know for sure, for sure. He doesn't know. He thinks he might have. So you can't say you have to bring an offering because you don't know if you did it wrong, but you think you might have. So if you know for sure, then there's the, the chatas, the sin offering. Here, there's something where I'm feeling like, I, I, don't, I don't remember, but I think I may have done that. So he is nonetheless considered guilty of an offense, and he will bear the punitive consequences of his transgression unless he expiates it by offering up the following sacrifice. Because he did it, but he's just, he doesn't remember clearly that he did. So let's look at a closer look. Does not know for sure. For example, it is forbidden to eat the various animal fats that are removed and offered up on the altar in sacrificial rites. When one eats even a kosher species of animal, there are some fats that are not allowed to be eaten, those, and those are the fats that were offered up in rites, in, in, in offerings, even from the animals that are not sacrificed. The punishment for doing so is excision. That's something we've got to be very careful about. It is permitted to eat other types of fat from kosher animals, provided the animal was properly slaughtered, etc. If a person eats some fat, is not sure whether it was the forbidden or permitted type, he must bring a suspensive guilt offering. Why? Because in that case, and in many of the cases, is you should have made sure. You, you know, we, it, it, it's if if you're worried about eating the right thing. Then you'll be concerned before you eat it, just to ensure that this is the correct thing, that it's not the, the wrong type of fat, that's not, not a forbidden type of fat. So that in and of itself, the, the idea that one was not careful to to um, to, to discern before, or not careful to notice, and I'm saying, well, what did I just eat? What was that? I take that from the right, uh, you know. That's that it, it, it shows maybe that uh, lack of consciousness, which in itself is something that, for, that we really have to think about. If, if, if uh, this exercise is important to me, then it's something that I should be conscious about and, and not ask myself later, did I do that? So what I'd like to do now, if it's okay with you, is to leave this here and we will continue, God willing, next week. Willing, no, no, uh, no emergencies or crises. God forbid. Are there any questions? I take them now. I have, I have two questions, Mendy. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Number one. Um, so before they started eating meat, were there uh, animal offerings? Yes. So if you're not eating the meat, then. Well, 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 actually, let me, that, that was like, I'm a little too quick with that, yes. Um, at, it, from the Torah, um, it, at, Adam and Eve, in, up until Noah, we were not able uh, allowed to kill animals for food. There's a debate as to whether one could have eaten the animals that, that who died naturally. But there was no, they, they definitely didn't kill for food. And the, the Talmud tells us that, that Adam brought an offer. So that would have been totally consumed in the fire for God. Um, and um, it, it actually, and Noah also did it. And it, 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 it seems like even before, when he, when he finished with the flood, he brought an offering, even before God told him he can eat meat. So um, it's, but there was no official Judaism per se then, but obviously these are monotheists and they saw the, the, the value in it. Um, 
and um, but afterwards they were eating meat already. So, but so it, it, at least Adam and Eve, we find that they 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 brought at least one offering and probably Noah before eating before eating it. Rabbi, yeah. Rabbi, with Cain and Abel, uh, and you know I don't remember. Everything. Oh right, Cain and Abel. That, that's true. Cain and Abel, right there. Absolutely. I was thinking about Noah. That's that's explicit in the Torah. Because Adam and Eve is not explicit at all. Absolutely. Good point. Thanks for bringing that up, Donna. Oh, okay. I, ha I have one other question, which has nothing to sure. do with this, but it, it happened this past Shabbos. Um, does, does, is the word resurrection a Jewish word when it comes to Mashiach or anything in, in Judaism? Resurrection is an English word mm -hmm. that we use to, to, to translate um, a, a Jewish topic. Resurrection means that souls go back into bodies. That's a Torah idea. That's one of um, Maimonides' 13 principles of faith. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Okay. I pray that when the Mashiach comes, we can use flour. <laughs> <laughs> no. It seems from at least most of the commentaries that when Mashiach comes, we'll go back to offerings. Rabbi um, Ram Yitzchak HaKal and Cook, Rabbi Cook, the first chief rabbi of Israel, who was a great uh, Torah scholar and a mystic, he was he writes that, that when Mashiach comes, all our offerings will only be grain-based. Okay. <laughs> got someone in your corner, Helen. Well, thank you so much. Have a good week. Okay, be well. Okay. <clears throat>